so or webinar. So what we're trying, what I'm trying to do now is to give you a little bit of brief background on biophotonics and what we are doing at Tyndall in biophotonics and at IPIC in specific. So biophotonics has actually not been part of IPIC for a very long time. Uh, so, so before I go into that, so I would try to say a little bit about what is what is biophotonics. Why do we have biophotonics at Tyndall? And what are the opportunities that we can see that we have? So this is moving. I'm so sorry. I don't know why this is moving like this. Let's try to get rid of that. Uh, then we are doing some clinical oriented research and we are doing some more fundamental research at biophotonics. And I will quickly take a few examples of each of those just to give you a little bit of examples of what we could do. So now nothing is working. So why are we here? And where are we? So we are at Tyndall, obviously. And this is unfortunate that you can't do your internship at Tyndall, but you are doing it at Tyndall, but not presently in this building. So as I said before, biophotonics has not been part of IPIC from the start, but actually because IPIC, the, the Photonics Research Center, is very, very good at making component, optical components, and also package them to small devices. They're world leading in both making these components and, and in the packaging part. But then they thought that, okay, we actually need people being expert in the applications area of, of what we can use these for. So that's why they tried to recruit someone from abroad to build up a world leading center in biophotonics. Uh, so it happened to become me that was actually recruited to IPIC and to Tyndall. So Tyndall was also very, very interested in, in having this biophotonics activity because they have the, the group in life science and they are very strong in making medical devices, not necessarily from the biophotonics perspective, but any types of medical devices. And then the UCC was also very happy to, to join that. So, so they made a joint effort to actually recruit someone to build up this type of activities. And in order to get the funding from Science Foundation Ireland that is actually sponsoring this, to build up this type of activity, very generously sponsoring that, we need to come up with some type of impactful and excellent proposal what we are going to spend the funding on once we build up these type of activities. So I will get through some of these examples from the gastrointestinal tract to the ear, nose and throat, any bone and brain and lung. And then we have a number of more fundamental studies that we also will get through. And of course, we can't do all of that by ourselves, but we actually need to collaborate with people. And we have a number of other SFI centers, so centers that SFI is sponsoring, companies and other universities that we do collaborate quite a bit. And this is actually the team as it looks today, as far as the best of what I could get together today at least. So we are quite a few people already working in this. So presently we are like 27 people and nine positions to fill. So it's quite a big team already. And we are still we are already growing further to that. So, so we have a number of projects that is actually directly sponsored from SFI. So this would be this work package one, two, three, four, and five, where I will focus a bit on. But then we, we have got additional funding since we started. So we started less than four years ago now. So, so this is when we recruited the first persons. So we we here and Jackie were the two first people who joined the team. And since then we have all of these people joining from 17 different nationalities. So it's quite a multidisciplinary and multicultural team that we're working with. And why I'm st stressing that it's multidisciplinary is because biophotonics per se, it's the science of 
combining how you understand how light interacts with biological tissue and how you can use that to actually gain understanding for diagnostic purposes or either or either to treat and all of that Marcelo discussed last week a little bit but biophotonics is the combination of photonics and biology so to say so we need quite a bit of expertise in working with this uh, as you will see from the projects coming so the vision that we have is obviously to create the best research center in the world in biophotonics and to do that we really need to mentor the, all the team members so, so that everyone becomes as strong as possible and see the research opportunity as, as good as possible and to do that we need to do the best research possible and, and then to translate that to more impactful applications of biophotonics and then of course we need to disseminate that to the rest of the universe to see how how we evolve how the science evolved and how the technology evolved so these are the four main points that we are trying to do and key of that is obviously to develop the team members as much as possible so let's just take one example out of many i mean we have 27 examples here but let's take SANA as one example, just to give you an example how it could be to join a team like this. So SANA is coming from India, obviously. You have seen him as well. So he made his Master of Science in, in India. And then he moved to Europe through a Marie Curie network that he got a PhD position in Milan in Italy. So he made his, his PhD in biophotonics in a very strong team in biophotonics and worked with diffuse Rama spectroscopy and time of flight spectroscopy. And then once he finished that and after making a year or so of postdoc in, in Italy, we recruited him to our team to work on a number of different projects that we have. And right now, actually, he's not only working on this project, but he's also starting it spin out company called Biopixels. So this is a little bit of how you can see how one person can get along and move and, and develop within this. So what are we doing then? So, so I'm now trying to see what we are working on and give you a few examples. So to the right here, I just give you anatomy of, of a person and see the different types of disciplines in medicine. Each of the red ones is something that we are working on in Cork, in the biophotonics team. And all of the others are people working with photonics, but not necessarily in, in Cork. And these are the projects again, as I started, the GI, gastrointestinal interventions, the surgical guidance for bone and brain surgery, the monitoring infant lung function, and then we have these more fundamental studies on upconverting nanoparticles and acoustic tomography. And on top of that, we have other projects as well, like industry projects and high peak projects and so on, that have come in as fun funding later than SFI. So let's start with colorectal cancer. So colorectal cancer is, as you see, a very, very common cancer. And it's actually not very good to get because you only have like five years survival of 60 percent or something like that this is improving and it's improving because healthcare is improving with over time so this is very good news but today we have about 60 percent plus surviving five years after diagnosing of colorectal cancer so colorectal cancer is in, in the bowel, uh, large bowel of, of, of uh, your body. So what we are doing is then to work with them. Um, so right now is to improve the surgical outcome of colorectal cancer. So most of them are doing surgery and then they're doing radiation therapy as well. So we are trying to help or by already now screening elderly patients or more 
people age of 60 plus. And we are trying now to help them to also measure the optical property of the, of the tissue through an optical fiber probe, and then assess better the tumor margin and see what we can do to help them to take out the, the tumor the best as possible without taking away too much of a normal bowel, but to really get rid of all the tumors. And we are collaborating then with Michal Ryden at Mercy's Hospital, and we're also working with Laura Marker from UC Davis in the US. And Sylvia Melgar is also involved in these GI projects that we are working on. So the study that we are working on is a very, very simple optical device with a light source and spectrometers targeting the tissue here, getting the spectra. So that means the diffuse reflectance from that tissue as a function of wavelength over a very, very wide range of optical of wavelengths here. So throughout the visible range, which is this range approximately, and in the infrared as well, near infrared and, and getting out. So you see all these curves look slightly different. And you could actually discriminate between healthy and, and tumor tissue quite well to approximately 90%, 85-90% of sensitivity and specificity. And already here you see a little bit of what the duties are here in the biophotonics team. First, you need to create a system to develop that in the lab. Then you need to bring that to the hospital to actually measure on a number of patients to getting these type of data. And then you need to do all the data analysis and sophisticated statistics analysis to really get hold of, of how well can we discriminate those things. So this is what the, what the tissue looks like when we're looking at it. Another surgical guidance is when you drill in bone. And you have a number of these type of opportunities, especially when you're drilling now, for instance, in the, in the skull to reach the brain. You don't want to plunge into the brain, obviously, and destroy any, any of the brain. So you need to drill a number of holes in the bone, skull bone, and then stop exactly at the right position. And as you see here, quite a few neurosurgeons experience this type of plunging with the existing tube. So what we would like to do is to put in optical fibers in the drill, which is not very trivial to do, and measure the same type of diffuse reflectance to really help them to stop the drill at the right time. And to do that, we managed to, to modify an existing drill. This is a striker drill, so it's very convenient because by working they have a plant in Cork, so we're collaborating with them very closely. And we put an optical sensor on the tip of this drill here. And then we're trying to understand with optical simulation how light is propagating through this bone, since we know the optical properties of the bone and the brain and any other tissue. So we could actually model that in, in Monte Carlo simulations in this case. And then we will have a normal clutch that stops the drill as it should. But sometimes it doesn't stop as it should, and then we will have an extra safety feature with this optical sensor. And again, we, we come up to 80, 90% sensitivity and specificity in doing this type of drilling. So it seems to work fairly well. And this is a success. So now we're just looking at bones that we are drilling in, and this is where you see that it's almost penetrating, but it's stopping just before that. This is stopping as well, but because there is some type of blood vessel in the bone, so it's stopping because it senses that the optical property is, is changing. It should actually stop at that position. Here it doesn't, it stops, but while it shouldn't. So this is a failed positive stop. So it doesn't always work, obviously, and we're still working on making this better and better and package it better and better so it's really as compact as possible. And this is not the only bone guidance that we need. 
but we also have pedicle screws placement. When you drill in here, you place a screw in, in the vertebra and, and try to avoid the spinal channel here. So not really, because otherwise you can paralyze the patient. So it's really, really critical not, again, to penetrate here when you're doing this. And again, we put optical fibers on this drill or screw, and then we can see that this actually works quite well. And the challenging here is actually that the drill is obviously rotating very quickly. and You need to sort that with optical fibers. Not very trivial to solve, but it works quite well. So a third application is brain tumors. And if we looked at colorectal tumors, we have a survival rate of about 60%, five-year survival rate. Here we are about 20%. So this is really, really a fatal disease once it comes. And it's also very, very quickly progressing. So we, here we really need to help the surgeon as much as we can to really help them taking out as much of a tumor as possible, but sparing the, the normal healthy brain. And there are a number of ways to do that. And optics have become more and more used in that. And especially if you're using a contrast agent for fluorescence. So we're using 5-ALA, which is a precursor to heme and the heme cycle. So when you're giving the patient 5-ALA, it's producing first protoporphyrin that is then converted to heme to produce hemoglobin. But the protoporphyrin is strongly present. And actually, it's metabolized very much quicker in the malignant cells than in the normal brain tumor or in the normal brain. So that means that it's actually helping us to find the brain tumor on the brain tumor margin. So this is already used today clinically. But what we are trying to do now is to find a tool that would either skip the ALA because having no contrast agents at all would be much better, obviously, because there is no side effects whatsoever. And the other thing would be to try to quantify the signal. Now it's very, very subjective, saying that if a surgeon appear, thinks it's, it's reddish, then he thinks it's 5-ALA protoporphyrin fluorescence, so then he will take it away. But if it's not so reddish, he will leave it. And this is obviously very subjective. So we are trying to do this much more objective and see whether we can do that. So this is one of the projects that we are working on, on work, uh, working with neurosurgeons again at, at Cork University Hospital, and again with Stryker to actually work with tissue autofluorescence and again diffuse reflectance in order to be able to do it quantitatively. We need to measure both the reflectance and the fluorescence to do that. And we have a very bulky system that we have developed right now that is standing at, at the hospital. We are making measuring our patients. So right now we have about 30 patients measured. And these are the type of signals that we are getting. So, so we are getting not as good as we wish. So, I mean, we, we could discriminate to 80, 70, 80% sensitivity and specificity, but we would like to have it slightly better. So that's why we are improving it in the next generation system, a TR2 system that is supposed to be much, much better. And after that, we're actually already designing a TR3 system, which is based on photonics integrated circuits. So it should be very, very compact, like a few cubic centimeters rather than this bulky trolley system that we are using today. So this would actually be something that can be handheld in, in, in a system, in any surgical tool, could be part of that surgical tool and measure, and hopefully with better sensitivity and specificity. And this is what we are trying to do, to work on right now. And actually this type of system is now going into another clinical trial on liver tumors as well. So, so this is something that is expanding despite that we haven't received uh, the best data yet in the clinical trial. Further, another study would be then to go to infants. So now we are leaving bone and tumors. Now we are looking at healthy 
infants. So this type of babies, and they are almost healthy. The only thing is that we are actually looking at the preterm babies. They have a problem. And one of the problems is that the lung is not sufficiently developed when they are preterm born, especially before week 23, 24, they can have really severely dysfunction lungs. And that means that they can't really oxygenate the body as they should. So similar to, to the corona infections, I mean, the, the lung doesn't work as it should. And what we are trying to do is to see whether we can help these by developing a monitoring tool that would be non-invasive, absolutely non-invasive. So these are the techniques used today to, to find this type of, of dysfunction of, of a lung, uh, respiratory distress function is what it's called. And, and that is using x-rays. And x-rays is actually indicated quite a lot on these small babies for this reason. So all of the red ones is because of a, they need to look at the lungs and see how well the lung is working. So that's quite a lot of x-rays for these infants. And as you can imagine, you should avoid x-ray, especially for infants, because they have an entire life to live afterwards. So they are especially sensitive to x-rays. And these have to be taken every day in order to follow the, the development of the lung development. So what we would like to do is to use a photonics tool to replace most of these x-ray images and doing that with non-invasive monitor with, with uh, light and obviously measuring the gas absorption in, in, in the lung. So that is quite a unique project that we are trying to do. And in order to develop that project, we need to develop the system. So we're working a little bit of the system development, but that we're also relying on, on a company from Sweden, who is actually working with this GPX Medical. So they are developing the first clinical prototype to, to, with this technology. So, so this is something that is very interesting. But then we're also working with modeling of light propagation in tissue to see how we can predict how, how strong signal we can get and what volume of the lung we can measure and also what measurement geometry that we should do. So in order to do that, we need some type of, of anatomical images, and we get them from CTs of these type of babies. And then we segment them. So we say that these would be the lungs, this would be the lipid layer, the yellow here. We have the ribs here, the, the more beige, and so on. So we, all the organs we are segmenting in all the 500 planes that the CT generates. So we get the 3D stack of, of these planes. And that means that we can generate 3D volumes after segmenting. And then we give optical property to each of these organs from what we know from the literature or have measured ourselves. What should the optical properties be of these organs? And then we go into making tissue phantoms, anthropomorphic phantoms, so very tissue-like phantoms. You may have seen some of these. So this is a transparent phantom, just to see that we have all the different organs, like the lungs, the heart, the ribs here, and so on. So this is something that we can do, so that we can measure in the lab and see what geometry we should measure. In. But we should, all, we, we can also do near fast. So, so this is diffusion theory algorithm, and how you use that in finite element method mesh of this type of, of volumes. So then you have a source and then you can see where you actually generate the signal and how much signal you generate. So all of that is done. So, so from a little bit of building instruments to building phantoms, to measuring with lab equipment, to do again modeling of light propagation in highly scattering media, which is not trivial. So, so just to reflect a little bit of what are the duties in the lab that we are working on. So let's get to two of the more fundamental studies that we have. 
So here we have working with small nanoparticles. So these are nanoparticles about 20 to 30 nanometer in size. And, and you just get a, a number of these nanoparticles in a TEM so image here, electron microscopy. And these are very specific because they are doped. So these are nanoparticles doped with rare earth metal. And that means that you can have a terbium, for instance, that absorbing light and then do energy transfer over to tholium here. So if you have light coming in here, let me see if I can get this starting. So here you get light coming in here, you're exciting this, you have an energy transfer over to this one. And then you populate this level. And then you have another photon excited and another energy transfer. And then you populate a higher level and get out light again. So see it again, first energy transfer to this level, and then second energy transfer up to that level. And then you have an emission. And that emission is actually shorter wavelength than the light that you send in. So that's why you call it upconverting nanoparticles, because you get anti stoke shift of the emitted light. So that means that you could actually get very, very background free signal because nothing else is actually providing any fluorescence at that wavelength. So we excite at 975 nanometer typically and get an emission at 800 nanometer or 650 nanometer or 470 nanometer, whatever, depending on what levels we are targeting on the emission here. And that provides us with a very background free signal, which makes it very suitable for deep tissue imaging. And especially at this wavelength where you have very little absorption in hemoglobin in the blood. So 974 and 800 nanometer all penetrates very well into the tissue, as Marcelo mentioned last week. So this is meaning that we, we could make imaging deep into tissue, especially in animals. And this is what we're doing with Sylvia Melgar at the APC Center in Cork. We're measuring actually bacterial infection in, again in the colon to see how the gut health is working. So this works very well. We can do a lot of other things like temperature sensing, biosensing. We can do a lot of in vitro imaging so that means that take out tissue and do imaging in vitro. And actually, we just wrote a new proposal where we use these upconverting nanoparticles. We build this type of microscope looking like this to actually measuring histopathology slides. So what do you take from a biopsy and look at either tissue or actually blood-based uh, samples and try to measure certain types of, of enzymes sitting or proteins sitting on the cell surface that are biomarkers for malignant diseases. We are targeting breast cancer here. We're actually looking at a number of biomarkers here that are very specific for this type of breast cancer and help us stratify what type of treatment those patients should get in order to survive this breast cancer as best as, best as possible. We can also do optogenetics, as we are saying here, so where we actually illuminating here, triggering some, again, proteins, and this would be channeled rhodopsins in the cells, especially in the synapse in the, in the brain, to trigger events in the brain that can stimulate some type of motoric action or senses of the eye or something like that. So this is actually a very, very hot research area in, in, in the brain neurosurge, in the neuroscience right now to understand how the brain works. And then giving them this type of channel rhodopsin so that you can actually trigger them not with electricity, but with light and see what's happening. So this is another area that we are very interested in working with as well. 
So the last example I would like to bring up here before I finish off with a few slides on opportunities that we have is what Marcelo mentioned a little bit last week, acoustic optics. So combining light sending in here with ultrasound coming from this. So what happens in that interaction set when you have both light and, and ultrasound is interesting because light is very diffuse as we said before. Ultrasound, you can focus inside the tissue. So if you can target and only mod uh, modify the light that is interacting at the ultrasound focus, you know what, where that light is coming from. And that means that you can actually create an image with high spatial resolution deep into tissue, which is not really possible with only diffuse light because it's scattered every 100 microns. So every thickness of the hair basically you have a scattering event of light to quickly losing the spatial information of, of this diffused light. But by tagging the light, as we say, with the ultrasound, you can actually derive that light. And what's happening is that you, you get side lobes. So this is the laser light that you're sending in. And you're getting side lobes due to this ultrasound interaction. And this you can see as a Doppler shift of the light, basically, because you have movement of, of of the scatterers is inside this tissue region. So if you have a megahertz frequency of, of the ultrasound, you will have a Doppler shift about one megahertz here. So the ultrasound frequency. And if you consider that, okay, so you have a frequency of a light. So that, say that we have 800 nanometer here. So that is about 400 terahertz of light. And then you have a frequency shift of one megahertz. So this is a tiny number as compared to this 400 terahertz. So that means that the frequency shift from 800 nanometer is 0 0.000002 nanometer. So two parts in a billion of a nanometer. So you can imagine that having an optical filter to have absorption of, of the laser light but transmitting this light that is really, really difficult because you need such an extremely sharp filter here. So how do you do that? And this is where we have our research basically, is to use this type of slow light filters. So you have this light, laser light with the side lobes, and they coming at the same time, obviously, but after the filter, you would like to attenuate the laser light as compared to the frequency shifted light here. But you also time shift them. And how can you accomplish that? So what you do then is that you take a crystal. So this is a crystal doped with these rare earth metals. So it's almost transparent, or it's transparent in almost all wavelengths. But where you have an absorption of these rare earth ions. And because they are sitting, these ions, in slightly different places in this type of crystal, they all have slightly different absorption frequencies. They are very sharp because all the rare earth metals have very, very sharp absorption lines because they have a filled outer electronic shell. So, uh, so that means that this shell that you have where you have a balanced electron is very protected from the environment. And that's why you have very, very sharp lines. But since they are sitting in very different environment here, they have what we call inhomogeneous broadening. So every ion will have a slightly different absorption wave. And that means that you will get this type of relatively broad, now I'm talking about a nanometer broad or so, absorption profile here. So this is the absorption profile that you have. You don't really see that, that's really transparent, except for that exact wavelength. That could then be 818 nanometer, for instance. So it, at 818 nanometer, you have this absorption profile that is about a nanometer wide. But we said that the frequency shift is only two parts in a million of a nanometer. So you should have a very, very sharp, you should have a lot of absorption here and very, very sharp transmission window. 
And how do you accomplish that? So the way you do is actually you take a very, very narrow laser, very intense laser. And then you excite. So this is the ground state here. You come in with this light here, exactly matching this transition to, to this upper level here. So that means it goes to here and then it goes down again. It goes up and down, up and down until you have about 50% in every level here. So, so you have a lot of transitions going up and down. here. But you have another state here where some of these can go down to. And this is, has a very, very long lifetime to the ground state. So we call that a dark state. It, it really is a trapping state where you trap all the ions. So they go up and down and down. So you have 50% here, 50% here, but you start to depopulate. So everything happens to be here at, at the end, nothing here and nothing here. And that's why you don't have any absorption at exactly this wavelength, matching exactly that ion and that ion and so on. So very few ions that will have exactly that frequency. So that means that you can now burn a hole in this one where you have absolutely zero absorption. And here you can have a lot of absorption, 10 to the four or something. So, so very few photons at that wavelength will transmit through this filter. So you can build that from these rare earth metals that you have here. You can get them in powder and build crystals like that. And then you can burn a hole like that. And what is then the time delay? So if you now have this very, very sharp filter, which is only a megahertz wide, so, so very, very sharp, as I said, two, to the, two parts in a million of a nanometer. And if you have such a high edge of the absorption, then you will also cause the refractive index to change. And that means that the refractive index will change like that. And that means that actually the group velocity of the light will also change drastically because this refractive index is changing. And that means that the light slows down. This is what's called the slow light effect. You can actually slow it down through this crystal by microseconds. So that means that you can actually get both a discriminance in attenuation, because this is highly absorbing, this is not absorbing at all. And you only get this slow light effect at this wavelength, not at this wavelength, because here you have no gradient in the, in the refractive index. So that means that you get this both attenuation and time response. And you can now actually get the difference in attenuation of 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 7 between that window and outside that window. And this is exactly what we need in order to attenuate the light. If I go back to, to this figure here. So I would like to attenuate the red light from the laser, but the green light here, which is frequency shifted, I would like to get that transmitted through that filter going to the detector. So if we can accomplish to do that, we can actually accomplish quite a bit. This is the system that looks we need to do. So we have a laser here. We have to have it pulse shaped. We send it in here to burn the crystal in this cryostate here. And once we have burned that hole, spectral hole burning is called. So basically depopulating the ground state at that specific wavelength of the laser. Then we flip in a mirror, send it through the sample, looking at the shifted light, transmitting that through the filter, and then going to the detector here. So if we can do that, you can actually see seven centimeters deep in tissue and still have a good signal as compared to the red light, which is the non, uh, non frequency shifted light from, from the laser itself. So this is the signal to background we can see at seven centimeter. And this is a, in a tissue phantom that we work with. 
So the last project I would like to tell you just a few minutes about, or even less than that is, but actually the, the IPIC Center got new funding a year ago about where we actually have funding throughout 2025, I think. And that means that we will have a lot of funding for the entire center of about 3.2 million per theme. We have four different themes. One would then be the, the biophotonics theme where we're trying to build the world's smallest integrated image sensor that we can use for surgical guidance. But we also have managed to get money for PIAG students, 25 PhD students, and 27 postdocs. So there will be a lot of growth of IPIC throughout the next couple of years due to this type of center activities. So, so this is very good. And I would just like to say that this is a small camera sitting on the tip of this guide wire or micro catheter. So, so this could be as small as 300 microns in size. It's about five times the thickness of your hair. And this is a device that you have to go into, for instance, arteries to go up to the, to the heart to see how you can get out and, and get rid of atherosclerotic plaques or any type of formation that blocks the arteries in, in the heart. And then we have a sensor here. And then making it so small, we actually have problem because if it's only 300 micron, it's mostly have to be a steel guide wire. We don't really have space for optical powering or cables. So, so, so we have optical powering, we have optical communication getting out here. So quite a, an interesting project that actually involves all the competences we have at IP to build this type of device. And so we're trying to, to work on that and have a very, very good project going on. Just to give you a little bit of example of, as a researcher, as a PhD student, as a postdoc, you get to get around the world and meet people. And these are just all the conferences we, we attended last year. These are the type of training events that we attended last year. We also organizing our own schools, international schools like the Biophotonic School that we organized in Sweden together with Danish Technical University in Denmark. And we also organized a Sigma School of Lasers. And it was about to organize an IONS Ireland this May that actually got postponed due to the corona infection. So it will happen next summer, most probably, in Cork, where you have PhD students from across the world coming to attend this. And obviously, we're doing a lot of outreach activities as well, mostly around Cork. And Katrina is very helpful in doing that. So this is just one example of when we were out doing that. So obviously we have this very generous SFI award to build up a team, but this consists of these five work packages as I've described a little bit. Beyond that, we're looking at this acoustic optics to really develop a tool with high spatial resolution that can see through the body. So we're aiming for seeing 20 centimeter into tissue with a resolution of the ultrasound. So that's about millimeter resolution. So that would be a fantastic tool where we can do functional imaging at very high spatial resolution with non-invasive techniques like optics. We're also building these very compact microsensors. As you see here, these are the first examples that we're using in, in our project. And then being experts, at, I picked to build very compact devices. We're actually targeting the wearable sensors as well because we believe that that would be really a future in the, in the next generation, because we have all this type of artificial intelligence that will build on a lot of sensors, because we need a lot, a lot of data to build up all this algorithm to, to be clever in healthcare, in any other things that we are looking into. 
So we need all these sensors in order to have this telemedicine based on, on artificial intelligence somewhere taking care of all the information that's sent to them and then help find early diseases. So, so we are targeting that and also targeting to help the industry in core and elsewhere. So we're doing a lot of collaboration, as I said, we can't do this alone. So we're working with many, many groups across the world, as you see from here, just to give a few examples. And the impact, why biophotonics so important in Ireland, is because we have so much of a medtech industry in Ireland. So 15 of the 20 biggest medtech companies are based in Ireland. And actually, we have about 1% of a population working in medtech industry. And we have a second log largest exporter, European exporter of medtech devices in, in, in Europe. So, so it's quite a lot of impactful in Ireland on medtech. And just looking at the life science companies, this is just the cork areas. We have so many of them in the cork area, very close to collaborate with any technology cluster or medtech industry or life science industry in core. Very easy. We have a lot of collaboration throughout UCC and CIT, as you just see some of the centers that we are collaborating with here and Stryker. And all, only looking at the Tyndall and the Mercy's Hospital very, very closely interlinked here. And we are working quite a lot with various people at ICT for Health and so on. So just again, giving some examples of very close collaborators, very good friends from Malini Olivi in Singapore, Ryan Wilson in Toronto, and then these are local collaborators from the APC Center, from the Infant Center, and from the Assert Center in Cork, that we are very much working together with. So again, focus on the training and doing fundamental research, but we also need to do impact by collaborating and doing medical impact. So we're working with this ABC model, academic, business, and clinicians. And we are working quite a lot with various people, as I said, <coughs> from people working with components to systems. And that's where we see ourselves to build small compact system that we can use in the clinic and then evaluate them in preclinical and clinical trials and then go into the market execution together with the industry, either the big ones or to start small spin-off companies by Pixels is not even part of this list, but this is the newest spin-off that we have in Cork in IP. So again, I would like to finish with giving you a little bit of, hopefully you understand a little bit more what biophotonics is now, the, the uh, knowledge about how light interacts with tissue, how you can use that to diagnose things or to treat. I didn't talk much about treatment today, but this is also possibility. So why do we have biophotonics at Tyndall? Because we have a unique center, the IPIC center, to build very compact components and devices. And we need someone with expertise in biophotonics to really utilize that and, and get that out to the industry. We have a lot of that industry in Ireland and in Cork. So this is really, really well placed to do this type of research. We have a lot of opportunities here because SFI find this as a very strategic area of research. And there is a huge growth right now in this. And I think biophotonics is very well placed for the next generation, as I said, because we need so many sensors. We need to make everything much more compact. And biophotonics has all that opportunities. We do a lot of cl clinical oriented research to see whether we can help the surgeons, mainly to guide what they're doing better. And we do also fundamental research for the next generation to see how can we do much, much better in the future than possible today. So with that, I would like to thank you all for 
listening throughout this presentation. I hope you learned something from this. And I'm very happy to take any questions you may have at this moment. Thank you so much, Stefan. So if you do have any questions, um, if you put them in the chat, um, and then Stefan should be able to answer them for you. This is a very good question. Why are, is it so tricky to treat glioblastoma? So this is a tumor that is actually growing very infiltratively. So, so it's really, really tricky to get out. It's not a very central tumor with uh, easy to demarcate from a normal brain, but it's actually, so, so neurosurgeons typically, I mean, take the analogy with gorilla war. So, so they have small cells, everywhere around in the brain. So even, I mean, very early on, 100 years ago, I tried, tried to take out half a brain, just one brain lobe, and see whether that helped. And even that didn't give the patient full survival. So, so this is one reason why, they, why it's a very trick, tricky, to, tricky tumor to treat. Another reason is that it actually looks very similar to the normal brain. So if you're standing next to the surgeon in an operating theater and looking down, I would have no chance to say what is tumor and what is not tumor. So it's very, very tricky for the neurosurgeon to, to differentiate between the tumor and the normal brain. So they do that by looking at it in a microscope and also by feeling it, so tactile sensing with the fingertips to see how stiff it is. But it, it's very, very tricky, as I said. And also, of course, the brain is very, very sensitive. So, so you have to be very careful when you take things out so you don't take out any, any vulnerable, I mean, good tissue that you shouldn't take out. But you really need to get only the, the tumor out and spare as much of the normal brain as possible. So in the colon, it's very different because, I mean, you can take several centimeters margin. You, you can't do that in the brain because then you will lose a lot of vital functions. So, so that is another reason. So, so very good if you could be able to discriminate. And you target to get rid of between 95 and 99% of the tumor cells in surgery. Then is when you, you can get good survival rates. And then combine that with radiation therapy and chemotherapy. And, and still they only get about 20%. So, so that's really a poor disease to get. I hope it answers your question, David. So any further questions? Okay, well, if anybody does have any additional questions, um, they can almost always email myself or um, Marcelo um, and we can pass them on. Um, so thank you again, Stefan, for a really great presentation. Um, and thank if you.
the interns could just hang on um, to complete the poll, that would be great.